Me? Oh, it was me. It was me. It's my fault. Hey, guys, great to see you. Do you have a good Thanksgiving? Man, it's great to see all of you. I just want to tell you I love you. I'm so glad that one of the things I'm thankful for is just to be able to be your pastor, to be part of your lives, and uh, that my wife and I have this great privilege. And we just go back to the beginning, and we never, we never can uh, take it for granted. Uh, 13 years ago, um, Lurie and I hadn't even heard of Fishers, Indiana, and uh, God began to put this deep, restless spirit of discontent that he had a real mission for us in life. And uh, that's what I've been talking to you about these past few weeks, that you would uh, awaken to the idea that God has a mission for you personally, that it's not enough just to go through life kind of half existing, uh, letting life just happen to you, kind of waking up and just sort of whatever happens, but, but there would come a reality uh, on you that God put you here for a reason. And the purpose of margin isn't just uh, for margin's sake. I'm not asking you just to put margin into your life financially so that you have room and you'll just feel better. The purpose of margin is that you will, you will get on mission one day, that one day God will come to you with a great opportunity and say, this is what I want you to do with your life, and you won't have the obstacles that you'll be truly free to follow. And so I know that's what I want for you. That's what I've been praying for you to have and to experience what we've experienced in our own life that um, all those years ago, God came to us and said, we want you to come to uh, Fishers, Indiana and start a church for people who are turned off, people who are too busy, people who uh, believe in God, but they've been, become disconnected. And I wanna tell you that that mission is more important now more than ever. In fact, um, there's some real dismal statistics in our country today. Do you know uh, that <laughs> Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, you know what they're calling that now? gray Thursday because Black Friday wasn't bad enough. <laughs> we had a Black Friday. Now we have to have gray Thursday uh, so that we can have one more day where we can consume and consume and consume and get more. And we're missing the point of life. And people are missing it. And people are tur not turning to God. In fact, there's 92% more unchurched Americans today than there were um, 10 years ago. And that churches are closing their doors. And, and uh, that, you know, 8,000 Churches will close their doors in America this coming year. And I don't want to be that. It's, it's crazy to me. When Jesus walked the earth, uh, people flocked to him. People knew that he had answers for their life, and, and he does. He's changed people's lives here uh, by the hundreds over the last uh, years. In fact, look around. All these, all these names of people we're praying for, those are the people that are still coming. These are people that you love, people you care about, that we're just saying, God, please intervene, and hopefully bring them to a place where we can influence their lives. And so to that end, I've been telling you for months now about we're a church on mission with God. We're a church that are gonna be uh, sending people out uh, to reach all different points of our city. In the last uh, 13 years, we've started five churches. We're a church that meets for seven different services on Sunday now uh, in four different locations. Do you know that there's a church service uh, that happens on Purdue University campus, on Butler University campus? Did you guys know that? How many of you knew that already? All right, well, the, the most ironic thing about the Purdue campus is that it's led by a graduate of IU University, <laughs> which I just think is funny. <laughs> Pastor Clary Butler started that initiative a few years ago, and it's just taken off. It's a place where it's really thriving. And Pastor Clary has uh, become a friend of mine, came on board uh, to join our, ch our staff team uh, because I recognize the call of God in his own life. Uh, a phenomenal preacher, a, a speaker, uh, a man who's been in the ministry for 10 years, graduate of IU with a JD. Uh, 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 he's an attorney by trade, by training, but the call of God's on his life. And he's joined our staff to be uh, the, the pastor in residence here at the 96th Street campus, as well as our pastor of communications, and here's a man who was free to follow, who is pursuing the mission of God in his life. And I've asked him to come and share a piece of his life story and to conclude up and wrap up this series here today. He's just one of the many people that God is bringing on board that we're preparing to send out and launch out in the years to come, but today we get to hear him. So put your hands together, Pastor Clary Butler. Awesome, thank you. Good morning, Heartland. Uh, he is uh, just uh, taking his seat, but would you put your hands together for the visionary leadership of Pastor Darren Chesky? Thank you, sir. I'm appreciative of this opportunity and looking forward to, uh, to talking with you today, sharing with you 
just for a few uh, short moments. And I know some of you that uh, may not know me, you may be thinking to yourself, well, can he preach? And uh, I, I am uh, also thinking, uh, can you pray? Uh, so you, you may be uh, talking to your neighbor, can he preach, can he preach? And I'm thinking as I'm up here with uh, uh, God himself, can they pray? And so um, if I fail miserably today, um, I will only attribute, attribute it to the fact that you were unable to uh, pray and get your, <laughs> get your prayer to reach heaven. And so, uh, and so uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I hope that you all enjoyed yourself uh, for Thanksgiving. Um, those of you that enjoyed yourself, let's give God a round of applause for allowing us to see another Thanksgiving. <clears throat> Uh, there, there were two farmers uh, that were talking over Thanksgiving, and uh, uh, they were talking over their fence, and one of the farmers noticed in the yard of the other farmer that he had a pig with a wooden leg, a pig with a wooden leg. And so uh, that farmer said to the farmer who had the pig with the wooden leg, um, you know, what's, the, what's this pig with the wooden leg? What's that all about? I, I've seen this pig in your yard, and I've been meaning to say something to you, but uh, what, what's that all about? And so the farmer with the pig with the wooden leg said, oh, that's Rosilla. That's Rosilla, our prized pig. And uh, let me tell you something about Rosilla. Rosilla, uh, she, uh, she when, whenever we uh, had uh, uh, some trouble with our daughter and uh, our daughter was about to drown, uh, Rosilla oinked and alerted all of us and, and all of a sudden we were able to save our daughter from drowning. Uh, let me tell you something else about Rosilla. Rosilla, um, our prized pig, when, whenever someone was about to uh, break into our home, burglarize our home, Rosilla oinked, and when Rosilla oinked, uh, we were alerted and we were able to avert a disaster and our home was safe. Let me tell you something else about Rosilla. Um, Rosilla even alerted us when our home was about to burn down. Something caught fire and she oinked, and uh, we were able to avert a disaster. And the other farmer said, that's wonderful, but can you tell me a little bit about the wooden leg? Why would Rosilla, your pig, have a wooden leg? And, and that farmer said, a pig that wonderful, you can only eat a little at a time. <laughs> so I'm not sure what you had for Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, in honor of Rosilla, I didn't eat any pork for Thanksgiving. Uh, but, um, but hopefully you only ate a little at a time and you have a little left for the word of God. Uh, we're moving quickly to John, the sixth chapter is where um, our lesson on Thrive has us today. John, the sixth chapter. And we just have two verses there. When you have it, it is our custom to stand for the word of God. Would you stand when you have John, St. John, the sixth chapter and the 10th verse. John 6, 10 and 11 reads, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Love the privilege of being able to pray with you. Would you bow your heads? Dear God, we appreciate you for your awesomeness, allowing us to see another time that we call Thanksgiving so that we can share with family and friends, and even being here at this place, this moment, this hour. Now see about us. Make the things that you have to share with us in your word clear. And dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. you may take your seats. So, if you've heard of the story of the 5,000, one of the miracles, one of the many miracles that Jesus performed uh, in the Bible or demonstrated in the Bible, if you've heard of that miracle of 5,000, would you raise your hand? I just want to see, uh, take a poll of our constituency today. Yes, we've heard of the miracle of the 5,000. Um, if you've heard of the miracle of the 4,000, it is a similar miracle. Uh, it was after uh, the feeding of the 5,000. If you've heard of the miracle of the 4,000, would you, would you raise your hand? Yes. Uh, a, a few folks less have heard of the 4,000, and, and I would suggest that uh, few, fewer folks have heard of the miracle of the 4,000 because many preachers don't preach about the 4,000. Maybe because um, the stories are pretty similar, pretty similar. 
Many folks don't preach about the 4,000. We don't, we don't talk much in our small groups about the 4,000. Perhaps it's because it was 1,000 people less. I don't know. Many people don't talk about the 4,000. And, and as I began to look uh, at the uh, 4,000 and the 5,000, there was something that uh, got stirred up on the inside of me that, that suggests that we have to move from thanksgiving to thanks living. We've got to move from just saying that we're grateful to living an attitude of gratitude, living and demonstrating that we're truly appreciative for what God has done, is doing, and will do in our lives. And so the, the major difference, perhaps, between the stories, because there are some similarities and there are some little nuances, is that uh, the 4,000 actually had more provision. 4,000 had seven loaves. The story of the 5,000 had five loaves and two fish. And the story of the 4,000, there was no little boy to provide, but the story of the 5,000, you've heard of the lad or the young boy who was able to provide. The story of the 4,000 did not have this, which is probably the single most important part as a distinction between the miracle of the 4,000 and the miracle of the 5,000. And that is that in the miracle of the 5,000, once Jesus finished ministering to the crowd, he finished sharing and pouring into their lives, finished healing those that had been diseased or had been ill with infirmities. It got late in the evening and the disciples said, all right, Jesus, uh, it's time for them to go downtown to the marketplace so that they can purchase victuals. It's time for them to go and buy their own food they said these words as it pertains to the miracle of the 5,000. The disciples said, send them away. Send them away. And perhaps that draws the distinction on where uh, the disciples grew into maturity because they didn't say send them away some chapters later when it got to the miracle of the 4,000. Miracle of the 5,000 is mentioned in all four gospels. Miracle of the 4,000 is mentioned in only two, but in those two gospels, the disciples do not say, send them away. And so perhaps they have grown into thanks living. Let's evaluate. Let's evaluate uh, why and how we can go from thanksgiving to thanks living. I just have five points and uh, then I will be out of your way. The first thing uh, we glean and I will piece together the different um, gospels so that we can get as clear of a picture as possible uh, about the details of what happened at this miracle of the 5,000 being fed after Jesus preached and shared with them. The first, the first thing is that we should identify what we have. Identify what we have. Mark the sixth chapter in the 38th verse says, how much bread do you have, he asked, Jesus asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Identify what you have. Jesus asked over 100 questions in the Bible, and I don't think that there were any as important as this. Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? I think it's important for us not to gloss over that fact. This is something that's pretty important. It seems like it's just, uh, it's just happenstance. It's not that big of a deal. But Jesus asked a question, and, and, and any time the person with all of the answers ask a question, perhaps we should pay attention. Somebody ought to say amen to that. And so Jesus asked a question. He said, how much bread do you have? And they said, well, uh, we just have uh, five loaves of bread and two fish. But, but here's, here's where we should understand that we can move from thanksgiving to thanksgiving because we have to identify what we have. Jesus is the bread of life. And so for Jesus to ask, how much bread do you have? He's really perhaps saying, listen, I am the provider. And so regardless of what you think is about to happen, regardless of, of, of how many people you see need to be fed, if they're going to be fed, they're going to be fed through me. The Bible is very clear when Jesus said, nobody comes to, to the Father but by me. And so Jesus is the bread of life. How many of you believe Jesus is still able to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory? First thing you have to do is identify what you have. Identify what you have. Um, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to, to, to look over the blessings that God has given you. 
um, I, I, I got caught in that same situation. Um, I gave my life to Christ in 2000, and um, when I gave my life to Christ, I was a single man, and one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to get married. Oh, yeah. And I uh, wanted to uh, start a family and, uh, and, um, and, and see what else uh, the Lord had for me, but, uh, but I, I, uh, I became apprehensive and anxious, and I got ahead of the Lord, and uh, I, I asked the wrong young lady uh, if she if she would marry me. She's a lovely young lady, but um, she, she wasn't the one for me. I got ahead of God. And of course she said yes. Uh, <laughs> being tall, dark, and handsome such as myself. Uh, but she said yes. And um, it took three years for me to realize, three year engagement for me to realize I had made a mistake. Called off the engagement and she's doing well now. Uh, but but I, I, I got reacquainted a couple of years after that, reacquainted with a young lady who uh, lived in my neighborhood two minutes away. We grew up together, families grew up together, went to the same school, and uh, we knew each other for 20 years. And after God removed the scales from my eyes, I asked her to marry me. And uh, sure enough, she said yes, and uh, we just celebrated our second year anniversary. My wife, Monique, is here. And uh, isn't God good? <clears throat> and so God was able to bless me before I made the mistake of uh, getting ahead of him and trying to marry someone that he, he did not have in his will for me. But, but the thing that I want us all to understand is we have to identify what we have. Sometimes the things that we have been asking God for are right in front of our eyes. In fact, I might get about three amens on that. Second thing, second point. First thing, we've got to identify what we have. The second point, we have to appreciate what we have. Here's what the Bible says in Luke, the ninth chapter in the 13th verse. But Jesus said, you feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? We have to appreciate what we have. Let, let me hear you say that. Appreciate what we have. Yes, we have to appreciate what we have. Too often, we have wonderful things, but we don't appreciate it. Have you ever heard the phrase, um, you, you never realize what you had until, until it's gone? We have to appreciate what we have. There was a young lady one day, and uh, she read a book, and uh, she thought the book was horrible. It was poorly written. Uh, she didn't get it. And so she told one of her, her best friends, she said, hey, I read this book that I had been talking with you about, and uh, it just didn't work out for me. I'm sorry I wasted my time. A couple of years later, she was dating a young man, and they uh, got engaged. They were at dinner one night, and she, uh, she said, you know, it's uh, pretty interesting because you have the same name uh, of the author of this book I read once. She told him the name of the book, and uh, he said, uh, that's actually me. That evening, she went home. She reread the book. Took her about a week to finish the book. She called her best friend again. She said, you know, I, I reread that book I read a couple of years ago, and I love, <laughs> I love that book. I love that book. It's, it's the most amazing book I've ever read. And her best friend said, what are you talking about? What's the difference between when you read it before and when, when you read it this time? And, and she said, the difference is I fell in love with the author. You know, life is so much better when we fall in love with the author. God is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the alpha and omega. Do I have a witness in the building? He is the I am that I am. And if you're truly going to move from thanksgiving to thanks living, you've got to appreciate what you have. How many of you know you've got Jesus and that is enough? First point, identify what you have. Second point, appreciate what you have. The third point, uh, honor God. Honor God. Again, we're just piecing uh, the pieces of the puzzle together, and we find this piece of the puzzle in St. John, the sixth chapter and the 11th verse. The Bible reads, Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Jesus honored God. 
he honored God. He, he did what we call um, giving grace. You know, um, over your food, you give grace. Uh, and uh, etymologically speaking, uh, grace uh, has the same root as the word thanks or rejoice. That word charis means the same thing. It's the same root for both rejoicing and for grace. And so anytime God gives you grace in any area of your life, you have a responsibility to give thanks. You have a responsibility to give thanks. And so how do we give thanks? We give thanks by honoring God. That's what we do when we say our Father's prayer. We, we start with our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. You're honoring God before you ask for anything. A miracle is about to be performed. You read it already, you told me. A miracle is about to be performed. Something special is about to happen. But before any of that can happen, it's our responsibility to honor God. Let me hear you say that. Somebody say, honor God. <laughs> honor God. You have a responsibility to honor God. So the first thing is we've got to identify what we have. Second, appreciate what we have. Third, we have to honor God. Then fourth, and this, this is a distinction, the fourth thing, I only have five points. The fourth point is we have to bless what we have. Bless what we have. Matthew, 14th chapter in the 19th verse, gospel according to Matthew. It reads, then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Now, and I wasn't sure. I had to read this a couple of times when it said he blessed them. If he, were, uh, if he was blessing the disciples, if he was uh, blessing the multitude, the 5,000 uh, that included those men and uh, children and perhaps their cousins and Uncles and aunties, you know, whenever you're about to eat, a whole lot of folks start gathering around. Um, and so I, I wouldn't sure who the them was, but I realized that the them was the provision. God actually blessed the provision. God, we're, we're trying to move from just surviving to thriving. We're moving from thanksgiving to thanks living. We're moving from a, a state of, well, I'm thankful for that, to actually having an attitude of gratitude. God looked at what he had. He's honored God, and then he looked at what he had, and he blessed it. I'll say that one more time. I get excited about that because... Too often, I look at what I have, and I know it's not enough. I look at what I have, and it's not enough to pay the bills. It's not enough to get through school. It's not enough to, uh, to, to, to get from point A to point B. It's, it's not enough to even finish out the week, perhaps. But Jesus, showing us how to thrive, looked at the little. You remember, it was just five loaves and two fish, and he's got to feed 5,000 plus and he blessed it. In other words, he looked at what he had and instead of cursing it, instead of saying, you know what, I never have enough, I'm sick of this. He said, thank you. I don't know what's about to happen. You ought to think sometimes when, when you have what seems like it's not enough. And you ought to thank God for what you have. You ought to appreciate what you have. It's up to God to do the multiplying. It's up to God to find a way to supply all of your needs. You do still believe he's able to supply all of your needs. And so instead of uh, bemoaning or besmirching what you have, now you look at what you have and you say, something great is, I just have one more point. We know a miracle is about to happen, so you might as well thank God for what you have. Instead of saying it's not enough, you say, you know what? It's more than enough. How many of you are willing to say today, it's more than enough? It may not look like it, but it's more than enough. It may not look like it, but it's more than enough. Uh, you know, uh, the, the amazing thing is, um, if, if I'm ever drowning, if I'm ever drowning, uh, all I need is for someone to throw me a rope. I, I don't really care um, if the person throwing the rope is a Democrat or a Republican. I don't, I don't really care if the person is black or white, uh, Jew or Gentile, uh, Protestant or Baptist or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't really care. Just throw me a rope. Just throw me a rope. Uh, because the only thing that matters is that I get pulled to safety. I, I don't care if the person is even an Auburn fan. <laughs> 
All I need is a rope. And so, and so we get to a point of blessing what we have. Thank God for the rope. Thank God for the second chance. Thank God for the opportunity. Thank God for the little bit, because I know God can take a little and make a lot. How many of you believe that? Shout amen. amen. All right. Here's my last point. My fifth point is, is, is the part that uh, we don't really get excited about. <laughs> this, this point is that you have to break what you have. You have, to, you have to break what you have. Here's what the Bible says, Matthew, the ninth, excuse me, the 14th chapter in the 19th verse. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. You, you do not have a miracle. It was not pronounced a miracle until after the bread was broken. And too many times, we, myself included, we want to be used, we, we, we want to do spectacular things, we want to fulfill God's plan in our life, but we don't want to be broken. See, we like the, um, the uh, now I'm not part, um, but we don't like the I was broke. <laughs> We, we'll, we're even cool with the was part. So we're cool with the noun I'm not and even was. But I broke, we don't like that. <laughs> we like iPhone, we like iPad, we like uh, iPod, we don't like I broke. <laughs> and, so, and so the reality is, in order to get to the now I'm not, at some point, perhaps God has to take us through a process of breaking us. Perhaps God has to take us through a process of, uh, of uh, understanding that without him, we're unable to do anything. Right, here's the uh, uh, last thing I want to share with you, and then I will conclude. God took me through a similar process. Uh, I'm not just standing here because uh, I, I called Pastor Darren one day, and then all of a sudden he said, hey, come on up, and uh, I want you to share. Uh, no, I'm here because I had to go through a process, and it was a painful process. It wasn't just uh, the process of making making some poor decisions in my life. But uh, uh, as you heard, I went to law school. And I went to law school because I have told people since I was 10 years old that I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, I wanted to be a lawyer um, until I went to law school. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought it was all about Matlock and Johnny Cochran. That's, that's what I thought law was. And so, and so I, I got to law school, and I've, I've got my books all, all on my table, and I would even invite people over to my apartment so that they could see my books stacked high and appreciate the fact that I was in law school. And uh, until reality set in that uh, there was a lot of hard work to, to be done. And um, no offense to my lawyer friends that are in the building, but uh, the legal profession is very boring. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, one year in, I realized I didn't want to do it. I had no idea at the time God was calling me to ministry. And uh, so one year in, I'm in law school, and I've got to make a decision. But I'm not a quitter. So um, I'm going to finish law school, but I really don't want to be in law school. I'm going to go ahead and be a lawyer just because I already started the process. And I, I believe the word of God. He that hath begun a good work shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I, I believe that, but I really don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. And, and I, get, I got a note from, from the dean. And um, the note from the dean said, Clary Butler, that's me. Um, Clary, um, we uh, regret to inform you that your grades have fallen below uh, where it should be. There's a minimum requirement that you have to have in law school. And uh, because I was not uh, excited to be there, uh, my grades fell below. And uh, the note said, um, you have one semester to improve your performance or you will be removed, uh, in other words, from law school. Um, this was my breaking point. It was embarrassing because I had told everybody that this is what I'm doing, this is what I was going to do. It was a breaking point. It's Thanksgiving. I appreciate God for allowing me to be in law school, but I had to move from Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving. And so uh, I got to a point where I actually, I actually thought about committing suicide. To show you how tough it was. It was very difficult. Can I just be honest? Because uh, confession is good for the soul, it's bad for the reputation. <laughs> But it's good for the soul. 
And uh, I actually thought, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine and a uh, student also with me in law school did commit suicide that year. But I decided I wasn't going to give up. I wasn't going to do anything silly. And, and I decided I was going to turn it over to the Lord. If he could provide with two fish and five loaves of bread, certainly he could take my little grades and turn it all the way around. And uh, so I decided I would pray after uh, and before every exam. Before I even wrote my name on the paper, I would pray. I decided to fast. Decided to rededicate myself to the Lord. And decided that I would be just as studious with the Word of God as I was with my legal studies. Got to my last year in law school. My grades turned around. They allowed me to stay in. Praise the Lord, everybody. And uh, got to my last year in law school. I got another letter from the dean. Uh, and the, the letter said, Clary Butler, that's me. Uh, we, uh, we've been monitoring your grades. And uh, we, we want to award you with this scholarship for your final year in school because of your performance. I don't know how you feel, but that's a reason to give God some thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I accepted their scholarship. Uh, I graduated in 2004 uh, from uh, IU School of Law. And I believe it was because I, I went from just being appreciative to actually living the process. From thanksgiving to thanks living. From surviving to thriving. If that's what you want to do, would you stand as we're about to pray? with bowed heads, humbled hearts. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're coming to you now because you are a supplier, a provider, a way maker, a burden bearer, a bridge even over troubled waters. And so we thank you. We identify you as our source. We honor you. We bless you and we bless what you have given to us. Please forgive us for all of the times that we looked at what you gave and said, this isn't going to work. Lord, we now thank you. And we stand waiting on the rest of your promises to be fulfilled in our life. Help us, in Jesus' name, to always have an attitude of gratitude, moving every day from thanksgiving to thanksgiving. In Jesus' name.